This video will look at internet threats and security. So we've done quite a lot of uh, work on networks recently. We, in the, in the previous videos, we've looked at the advantages, we've looked at a few disadvantages as well. Uh, but the whole point of networks um, is that computers are connected together so they can share um, information, they can communicate with each other, they can share resources. Now, as we said, this brings a lot of advantages, lots of benefits, but one big issue is that because computers are all connected together on a network, if someone managed to gain access to one computer, if they had the right know-how, they may well be able to access um, other computers on that same network because they're all connected to one another. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a look at some of the threats that face networks and some of the security uh, that can be implemented to try and reduce those threats. So there's a lot of threats, a lot of attack methods uh, that criminals use. Uh, they might be um, producing and installing some malware, might be phishing, might be brute force attacks, might be SQL injections. What we'll do is we'll look at a few of these um, over the next few slides so we have a better understanding as to how these threats actually work. So malware. Malware is software which will harm a computer or a user. And certain types of malware will be specifically produced to harm a computer, whilst other ones will be there to uh, specifically target users. So viruses, spyware, adware, farming, these are all examples of malware. So viruses. Viruses are programs that aim, and it's important to distinguish this from um, other types of malware, it's, cause, it's aim is to cause physical harm to a computer system. So don't get it confused with spyware or adware, which really sort of focuses on um, targeting the user. This is about targeting um, and trying to cause physical harm to a computer system. So we've got a standard virus. So these are, um, these sorts of viruses, they hide in programs, they replicate themselves over and over again, they spread out across uh, to other programs and files, and often their aim is to delete or damage the data that is on the computer. So it's physically there to damage the data. You could have worms, another kind of virus. Now they don't necessarily damage data, but what they do is they rec replicate themselves over and over again, um, and by doing so, they slow your computer down, they use up your computer resources, so they might um, take a great proportion of processing power um, as they replicate themselves and therefore turn your computer into a sluggish, useless machine. And you've got Trojan virus as well. So these are often um, look like um, good, you know, useful programs. There might be a game, there might be a utility. Um, but in the background, what they're actually doing is causing a bit of harm. They might be deleting your files. They might be, might be making changes to your computer. Um, so it's important that you have an understanding that a virus causes physical harm to a computer, but there are different types of viruses. Okay. So another type of malware is spyware. So this type of, vir uh, this type of malware sorry, uh, is there to target the user. It's there to spy on the user and to send back to the criminal as much information um, that they can find out about them as possible. So it might be passwords, might be usernames, might be uh, websites that they've visited. So a common piece of spyware is a keylogger, and this is a little program that runs in the background, and every time you hit a key on your keyboard, it will record that hit. So what it can do is it can start finding patterns with uh, certain characters, strings of characters that you might be typing in. So if you say type the same uh, string of characters in over and over again uh, when trying to log on to different um, accounts, then perhaps the criminal will learn that that's your password. And the reason for collecting the data is so that the senders of the spyware, so the criminals, can use the information to steal your identification or perhaps sell you information, uh, sell your information to third parties who can then target you with adverts. Okay, adware. So. This type of malware, again, it's not about physically deleting data on your computer or causing harm to your computer. This, again, is focusing and targeting the user. So instead of, um, I mean, ultimately what it's doing is it's displaying unwanted adverts to 
the user. So it will collect information about your online habits. Um, it will learn about the sorts of things that you uh, purchase, and then um, it will. Its aim is to download and display unwanted adverts uh, to you. It might also try and direct you to other websites by changing your home page. Farming, another type of malware. So in the previous video, we learned about the domain name system, that glorified address book that um, an ISP will have. Um, so you type in a web address and then it sends back the IP address of that particular website so that your computer can access that website directly. Now farming, what farming does is it looks to change the IP addresses stored in the DNS. Okay. Now it might be uh, the DNS that is cached on your computer, so it might be that you've got a, um, a little address book on your computer that so you don't have to keep going to your ISP every time you want to um, go to websites that you seek. Um, a lot of the time. So it might make changes to the DNS that's cached on your computer, uh, changing the IP addresses to another IP address. So that when you type in, um, I don't know, let's say the, the, the BBC website um, address into your browser, so bbc.co.uk, uh, because the DNS has uh, been altered with a brand new IP address, you type in bbc.co.uk, but it actually takes you to a completely different website. So that is an example of farming. Okay. So other types of malware. There's scareware. So this often comes in the form of a, a pop-up, says that you've got a virus, and then it will advertise some software that will help you uh, get rid of that um, phony virus, um, forcing you to sort of um, pass your money over to them. Got ransomware. So this is malware that will lock your computer. Uh, it will make it completely useless and then it will demand you uh, pay a sum of money in order to get your computer working again. And this happened to the NHS um, a few years ago. Um, there was a, a ransomware attack and um, thousands of computers um, all across the country in the NHS uh, were locked. Um, and the only way that they could get that back, uh, they thought, would be to, to potentially pay some money. Uh, luckily, um, someone managed to find a kill switch, um, and that was um, that problem was was over by the end of the day. And root kits. So these uh, pieces of malware they contain sets of tools uh, which, once installed into your computer, will allow a criminal to um, pretty much access your computer at the highest level. So they can do pretty much what they want with it. So root kits, set of tools that are installed onto your computer. Once a hacker is inside your computer, they've got all the tools that they need to do pretty much whatever they like. Phishing. So phishing is a method that criminals use to try and get as much sensitive information about a user as they can. So it might be usernames, passwords, bank details. So one way in which they do it is they might email um, a user, they might make a phone call, they might pretend to be from a legitimate company um, and um, through a bit of social engineering uh, they'll be um, hopeful that you will pass over your, um, your, your sensitive information. So often the emails and phone calls they try and impersonate these legitimate companies such as banks uh, so it might be that you get an email that says it's from paypal.com. Um, they might have the PayPal logo, it might have the font style. It might look exactly um, like a, a standard email that you get from PayPal. But in fact, it's a, um, a phony email. Uh, your, your account won't have been compromised, even though it says it is. Um, and the, the main aim of this is so that you give away your PayPal password so that some criminal can then access your account. People. People are often one of the biggest threats uh, to a computer system, to a network. Um, so with phishing, we, I just said that a um, bit of social engineering to try and get people to give away their passwords. Um, people are often the main reasons why networks succumb to attacks and loss of data. So social engineering is the act of manipulating people and is often used by criminals to force people to make mistakes uh, which can compromise a network security. And as we know, human beings are fantastic at making mistakes. So 
It might be that people are duped into downloading viruses or other malware or tricked into unwittingly giving away their passwords. And the, the, the way to get around this is, is really educating people about the various threats and tricks that criminals use. Another method used by criminals uh, to gain access to a network is to try a brute force attack. Now a brute force attack is very straightforward. It's just people, a uh, well, criminal using trial and error to hack an account by trying thousands of different passwords over and over again. So they try to repeatedly log in um, trying one password over and over. Now, if you had a lock on an account, if there were three unsuccessful password attempts, then that would greatly reduce the threat of uh, anyone ever carrying out a brute force attack successfully. And another thing is to ensure that passwords are complex. So if they're complex and they've got a um, quite a lot of characters, uh, and there's a mix of symbols and numbers and capital letters, then they are less likely to be tried in a brute force attack due to the increased possible alphanumeric combinations. Denial of service attack. So this is a method that seeks to bring down websites uh, by using up the web server's resources. Now it's done by having lots and lots of computers often acquired through malware to repeatedly try to, to log into a website. So if this uh, website suddenly has a huge amount of traffic, it puts its resources, the web server resources, um, under lots of pressure. So it causes the server's CPU and memory to be uh, used up so the computer crashes. And then criminals might demand money in return for the attack to be stopped. Often the reason for doing this is to punish websites that they think are unethical or corrupt, but there's lots of different reasons why a denial of service attack might be carried out. So data interception and theft is another internet threat or another threat to, uh, to a network. So we know that data travels across and between networks in data packets. Now, what hackers can do is they can use something to, to monitor network traffic so that they can intercept any packets that they believe contain sensitive data. They use something called packet sniffers. They sniff out the data packets, they decode them, and they steal the information inside. It might be passwords, it might be bank numbers. And this is an example of why encryption is really important. If data is scrambled before it's sent across the network, then if it is intercepted, it won't be readable, and therefore uh, the hackers won't be able to actually steal your sensitive information. SQL injections this is another threat to a network in particular it's sort of based around um, accessing um, information in a database so an SQL stands for structured query language it's used to look up data in a database and when you log in to an account you'll add your username and password um, into a couple of input boxes you've done this before when you've tried to access your account um, online so when you press enter in the background the two bits of information that you've entered your username and your password they're added to an SQL statement and this might be an example of uh, the kind of SQL statement that a, um, a database might be um, given. Select account where username is bjones and password is password, whatever the password is. So this is a standard sort of SQL statement. Now with an SQL injection, um, a criminal might bolt on some SQL at the end of the password. And this will alter the SQL statement overall and allow access to accounts of other users. So for example, what they might do is they add on to the end of, as they're entering a password, they might then um, add on the end of a, a made up password or star, okay, or, or asterisk. And what that's, that does is it's a wild card. So effectively we're saying select account where username is bjones and password equals password or star. So that wild card will mean, okay, where the username is bjones, it doesn't matter what their password actually is, We've got a wild card, so therefore access is granted. So most websites have appropriate measures to validate that only a password is entered and entered and no SQL code in addition to that. So poor network policies. Every um, network needs policies. When, when we talk about policies, we're, we're talking about rules of how to use the network. 
So network policies are there to make sure that the users use the network in the appropriate way. And the sorts of rules and procedures that might be included in network policies might be to use complex passwords, to have different levels of access so certain people in companies can access um, bits of data when others can't. Uh, locking computers when a user leaves their desk. Those are the sorts of things that um, can be implemented, the sorts of policies that can be set up uh, to reduce the threats to networks. So if a network policy is poor or if it's not followed properly, then obviously the network uh, will be at risk. As we heard before, people are often the weakest point when it comes to system security. And this is an example of that. If a policy isn't followed, it's the people that are put in the network in jeopardy. Identification and prevention. Okay, so we've looked at some internet threats. Now let's have a look at some things that can um, take place to try and reduce these threats. So penetration testing is uh, where a company will basically employ um, some experts to come in and try and simulate a range of attacks. They might try out a denial of service attack, SQL injections, brute force attacks. And the whole point of this is to try and discover any weaknesses in a system, but in a, in a risk-free environment. They will summarize findings to the company that can then make improvements to their security. Now, because technology changes uh, very regularly, very quickly, criminals, they're constantly trying to find new ways to attack networks. So therefore, this testing needs to be done regularly with the most up-to-date information about methods that criminals are using. Network forensics. So this is where software is installed on the network which constantly monitors network traffic. So, you know, it might not prevent an attack taking place, but it certainly can allow a company to learn from it if it happens. So in the event of attack, the monitoring can play an important part in finding out how the attack was carried out and also by whom. The monitoring software will monitor data packets, so after an attack, suspicious data packets can be analysed forensically. Might well be able to find out who took, who carried out the attack. Certainly we'll be able to work out which data was uh, lo lost or uh, which part of the network were breached. So network policies. We, we talked about network policies before. The sorts of network policies that should be in place for a network are an acceptable use policy. So it might have rules as to how people should use um, the, uh, the network. Now we've talked about a few already, but n also not installing software, downloading files from the World Wide Web, uh, not using USB sticks because they might introduce um, some uh, nasty uh, bits of software, so it might be viruses, um, so we don't want that. Networks should have a backup policy as well. So it might sort of outline who's responsible for backing up the time, the frequency that the data should be backed up, what the data should be backed up on, so whether it should be a hard drive or, um, or whatever media. Um, the location of the backup should really be off-site. Um, and also we would need a disaster recovery policy. So this would include the people that are responsible for um, actually uh, recovering that data after it has been uh, backed up. So in the, in the event of data loss, we need to outline exactly who's responsible for recovering the data. So the organization who, uh, who will help supply the resources, the hardware to get the systems back up and running will also be outlined in the disaster recovery policy. Antivirus, anti-malware software. So these are um, programs that seek to try and um, identify viruses and once they've been identified they might be quarantined if they can't be deleted or if they can then they will be deleted. So antivirus software has got to be up to date for them to be um, effective. So anti-spyware software, okay this is very very similar we know what spyware is uh, but the idea is that we need to have some sort of software uh, which um, hopefully can identify the spyware and uh, remove it or quarantine it once found. Okay, a firewall. So when files are sent across the internet, when data sent across the internet, they're broken down into uh, small data packets. And the part of the computer that actually receives these data packets um, 
is made up of 256 ports and you can think of this um, a little bit like the ports that you might find around a country. So you have airports, you have um, shipping ports um, and the idea is that anyone that's coming in and out of the country they can just monitor um, who they are and if they aren't allowed into the country then they can um, stop them um, at the port. And it's a similar thing with a firewall. The firewalls monitor the data that flows through the ports that comes in and out of a computer. Um, some ports are kept closed and um, only open to uh, the expected data. So incoming emails are usually sent to port uh, 110, for example. So having ports closed protects the computer from hackers um, and it continually monitors um, the, the activity so it can detect hacker activity. So if we look a little bit deeper into a firewall, all it really is is just two network cards. So when data packets are received, they come through a data, um, a, a network interface card, sorry, um, and they're analyzed and they're either allowed to go through into the computer or they are rejected. And the rules which govern that are the protocols of the firewall at that time. So it might be that some unsavory data packets, deemed unsavory by the rules of the firewall, of course, uh, might be stopped and therefore unable to continue their journey to the receiving computer. So that's packet filtering. Proxy servers. So similar idea to a firewall, a proxy server, uh, which is kind of a, a standalone computer um, that's connected to um, maybe uh, the network, and also the, the internet might sit between. Um, they can limit the data that passes from a computer through a network to an external computer. So a proxy server is just a computer that receives all the internet requests before sending them out onto the internet. So it'll look at each request, it will look at it against the protocols, against its rules, and if it meets the rules, then it'll pass those internet requests onto the internet and the user will have access to that, um, that service that they require. But if the request for a website is blocked on the or, or on the filtered list, it won't be um, forwarded to the internet, and the user will be unable to access that server uh, service. And if you think about um, a school filtering system, this is exactly um, what what would happen um, if you've got um, hundreds of computers in a school. Um, and uh, you're a, a user of one of those computers, if you try and access certain websites, you might be blocked. And the reason for that is that your um, request to go onto the internet is passed through the school's proxy server. It doesn't meet the rules um, and your request is blocked. Okay, so that's how school filtering works. Now proxy servers also have another use. They can provide privacy online. So some servers allow you to uh, they will accept your internet request regardless of what it is and they'll forward you onto the internet but they'll do so using their own IP address and not yours so it will actually protect your IP address. Also some proxy servers they're dedicated to caching common websites so that a user can browse a copy of the site without actually accessing it directly and that can reduce traffic to certain websites as a result. User access levels, another security method. So this is where users of a computer system are given different access rights depending on their role on the network. So potentially some users will have access to really sensitive information. Uh, perhaps these are management um, and perhaps other members of staff might have um, limited access to uh, certain parts of the system. So a school, in a school for example, students will have access to their documents uh, within their own account, whereas a network manager will have access to all accounts um, so they can they could potentially uh, look at any documents that any students have. So access levels are really important to protect um, the sensitive information within a school. Um, we need to make sure that, you know, for a given organisation, that certain bits of data cannot be uh, viewed by certain people, cannot be sabotaged as well. So access rights are very, very important. Passwords. So they're another security method put in place uh, to make sure that a network doesn't have unauthorized access. Passwords have got to be strong, okay? So they, you they need to be complex, and the reason for that is to make them harder to be cracked under a brute force attack. They should be changed regularly for similar reasons. And encryption another really important security method. 
So this is where data scrambled before being sent across a network so that if it is intercepted, it is unreadable. Um, and we've heard before, but to encrypt data, an encryption key is used to convert the plain text into cipher text. An encryption key might just be an algorithm that looks at each bit of data in a file and just uh, converts it. So it might be um, that each letter of a text file is, is converted to the next letter in the alphabet. And for cipher text to then be converted back to plain text, a key is then required by the recipient to reverse the encryption. But what's important is that that encryption takes place so that any data that's sent across the network that's vulnerable to be sort of sniffed out um, and intercepted cannot be readable.